Hi, my name is Climate Savage. I do classical civilizations, and today I'm going to be going over women in tragedy. And the books um, that are included in tragedy are the Medea, Trojan Women, Agamemnon, and Ajax. So I'm going to start with Ajax. And in Ajax, the main woman obviously is Tecmessa. And Tecmessa's story is sad. She loves her master. Um, we can put this with a quote. Um, Ajax, our lord, our strength, our rock, lies fallen. But unfortunately, she's not respected by Ajax. And he says, women should be seen, not heard. The old, old story. And I kept obedient silence. Ajax calls for his son and brother in despair and addresses the chorus as his only friend, but he fails to see that Tecmessa is actually his only true friend. She understands him better. She says when he's, um, after he's um, like recovered from his madness, she says now he's well, but bitter grief torments him, compared to the chorus, who just says what's past is soon forgotten. They really don't understand him. Do they not know Ajax? Do they not realise that Ajax is all about humili not being humiliated, being respected? So why would they say what's past is soon forgotten? Why would they believe that if they really knew him? And her speech is based on Andromache's in the Iliad, if you read it. Um, she refers to them as man and wife. And um, when he dies, she expresses despair. Well, no, he, she expresses despair at the thought of his death. And when she's talking, she's saying, where can she go? And she says, you're all but my all. Have you forgotten me? Which really shows that um, he, she actually is, um, no, he actually is everything to her. She has nothing if she doesn't have him. Um, she also says, love must breed love. And it's a very touching speech. It's very sad because it really shows how much she cares for him. But Ajax just replies, I'll say she is right only when she can show she is obedient. Which is quite sad, he doesn't realise. But And his speech is about himself and his parents and his son when he dies. And the only reference, um, not when he dies before, just his normal speech, but the only reference to Tecmessa is where he tells Eurystices, I think that's how you say it, to make your mother happy. So he, he doesn't reference, he doesn't talk about her. Um he just mentions her to make, like, make his son proud um, he tells her quickly um, he tells her directly quick out of my sight which if we were the Iliad is a direct contrast to the Iliad scene as it's based on where Hector's kind and worried about his wife and Ajax really isn't kind and worried about his spear wife um, she's the only one who suspects that his lying speech who is indeed a lie um, she cries, the wretched man deceives me after all. It's plain he does not love me any longer. And she's the one that gives orders to search for him and the chorus follow her instructions. And after his death, she's one of the ones that feels real grief. She says there's nothing left to me to live, nothing left for me to live for. And this is contrasted with the chorus. Remember, he thought the chorus were his real friends, but they're obviously not. Um, but the chorus, when he dies, they go, oh, that's the end of our homeward sailing. They're only concerned about themselves, um, which is sad. She proves she did understand him. She said, he lies happy. All he desired is death of his own choosing, and that he has. What right have they got to laugh? And sadly, once Chisa arrives, she's basically removed from the play. She's instantly forgotten. Priorities are the problems of men, which reflects how the 5th century Athens sees things. Tecmessa's position in society ensures that despite her intelligence and her loyalty, she's either ignored or undervalued. So that's sad. The next book I'm going to look at is In the Agamemnon, and I'm going to look at Clytemnestra and Cassandra. Begins with Clytemnestra, and everyone kind of sees her a bit like a man. Um, a <laughs> direct quote is, she manoeuvres like a man. I think the watchman said it. Don't quote me on that. It's either the watchman or the chorus. I don't know. You probably need to check that. But the quote is, she manoeuvres like a man. She sets up the beacons um, to show when they're coming home. And that's a male strategic plan. And she's praised by the chorus for speaking like a man. Maybe also the chorus. Yeah, she's praised by the chorus for speaking like a man. Um, she kills Agamemnon um, and Cassandra with a sword. That, that's manly, because killing is manly, it's heroic. 
and she proudly boasts of her achievement over the body like a merit hero. She challenges the chorus, going, I'll meet you blow for blow, and points out gender inequality when the chorus try to exile her, but never punished Agamemnon for killing Phigenia. Um, I can't remember the direct quote for that. Um, I might put it in the bottom if I remember. I'll put it in the description, but basically it's something like, how dare you try to exile me or something? Yeah, something like that. Um, however, she's driven by the maternal female bond with Iphigenia, her daughter, saying the agony I laboured into love. Um, of course, that's her whole motive, one of her whole motivations behind the killing of her husband. Um, so that's quite sad. And she also manipulates, which is considered very a very female trait, um, namely with the red carpet scene, with the tapestry scene, which where she appeals to Agamemnon's ego, and um, like for example, she's like, oh, what would Priam have done if he had had your success? So. And Agamemnon's like, oh yeah, I should. And she's like, oh, you're like a god, you should do this. And at first he's like, oh no, I'm not like a god, or the gods would be angry. But then he commits hubris a lot. But um, And then he, after she persuades him, he's like, oh yeah, he does. And he walks on it. He's like, slave, take off my shoes so I can walk on it. And he does. Um, she also controls Aegisthus by appealing to his ego at the end of the play. Um, she plays a loyal wife and weak woman. Um, when Agamemnon returns, saying she missed him and that she sent her their son away, she was scared she couldn't protect him without her husband. Uh, that it's actually quite funny because she's talking about um, her children and she's like, oh, something like it's so sad she, they're gone or something. And he's all like, oh, she's talking about Virginia. And she's like, what, what do you mean? I'm talking about I'm talking about your son. I'm talking about Orestes. And he's like, oh, okay. Cause, so he doesn't realise that she's still upset about Virginia, which is kind of stupid because obviously she'll be. Um, but she also... Oh yeah, she also does need a man to help her rule. If she can, she must be. She's really strong. She's really manly and stuff. But she won't be accepted unless she has a man to help her rule. Um, Aegisthus is uh, described as wolf, whereas she's described as a lioness. Um, but he takes credit for the killing. He comes in. He's like, oh, a perfect day for vengeance and stuff like that. So it's stupid. So he immediately takes the role of ruler, even though she was the one that did it. <laughs> Um, so that was quite a message. I'll go to Cassandra, and Cassandra's story is sad, you should know. Um, she's shown to have the lowest position in society, and she's ignored or treated as mad by the men around her. Um, however, unlike Agamemnon, um, she does die like a king. She, um, accepts her death and goes to it. The chorus, I remember, um, talked to her and like, why don't you run away? You can run. And she's like, well, what would be the point in that? And she takes off all of her clothes and stuff that um, that she had to wear, like to be the prophetess that were given to her. Um, she completely disregards them all. She walks in silent. And when Agamemnon's killed, we hear all the screaming, we hear all the sh like yelling, and the chorus like whoa. But when Cassandra's killed by Clytemnestra, we don't hear anything. And that really shows that she's gone to accept her death. And it's quite sad, but it shows how noble she can be. Um, yeah, she braves the curse of the gods, which um, Agamemnon didn't do, obviously, and she really does prove that women can be intelligent and courageous. So, yeah, that's, that's nice. Um, what should I do next? Yeah, I'll do Trojan women next. So, so far I've gone through the Agamemnon and the Ajax. If you've like, fallen asleep, I'm really sorry. This is a long one and it is one we need. So, the next one I'm going to look at is Trojan women. So this is Woman and Tragedy, Trojan Woman. And, yeah, this play is called Trojan Woman, so you can guess that it's going to be a lot about women in tragedy if the actual play is called Trojan Woman. So, yeah, it, the play shows um, the fate and the misery of the disenfranchised. Um, usually we're only really showing the perspective of the victims of male dominance. Um, so, yeah, so this is kind of a different play. And only one of the Greek leaders, um, I don't know how to say it, but dying, it's about D-E-I-G-N-S, so he comes in, to, he uh, like comes down to speak to them at all, and that's Menelaus, and that's only because he's come to claim Helen, he hasn't come to really talk to all the women and be like, hey, how are you, he's only come to claim Helen. Um, decisions are made arbitrarily, 
sorry, I don't know that word either. <laughs> um, I know what it means, I don't have to say it, um, about their fate. And they're made really easily as their judges don't have to see their pain and misery. Um, the women are shown to be c completely powerless, like Ajax drags Cassandra off by force. That's a quote. Um, the women in this play are generally seen as property. Polyxena met a wretched end, sacrificed to honour the dead Achilles. Cassandra was, quote, chosen as a special prize by King Agamemnon to warm his bed. Hecate laments that Cassandra has not been granted the gift of lifelong virginity, but Tithibius replies, well, is it, it is not, is it not a great honour to gain a king's bed? The Greeks can't understand the perspective of women. He just thinks that Cassandra should be honoured and proud that she's been chosen to be, um, like, going to be in a king's bed and stuff. He doesn't understand the, why they're upset about it. Um, Cassandra, however, is the only woman of Troy to view her fate optimistically. Although we can't really tell if she's actually being optimistic or if she's just being really brave. Because obviously when she comes in she's like, oh what a wonderful day, it's going to be a wedding, I'm going to get married. But she's a fortune teller. She knows what's going to happen to her, she knows that everything's going to happen, she's going to die and stuff. So this might just all be an act put on to sort of keep her mother calm. Um, yeah, so I like Cassandra. <laughs> um, where are we up to? Oh, that's song, sorry. <laughs> we have songs in the background. Um, yeah, Cassandra tells her dead father. Oh, yeah, sorry. That was really confusing a second. Yes, yeah, so when she's talking in her voice, she tells her dead father that he will see her soon like a conquering hero. And obviously, we know that's true um, if we've read the Agamemnon, because she does see her death like a conquering hero, which is nice. Um, yeah, her knowledge of Agamemnon's fate gives her a sense of justice and retribution, but this is denied to all the other women. Um, the tragedy is that since she's considered mad, it brings no comfort to the others. So, but that means she does get away with loads of things to say. I think, I can't remember who it is, Talthibius? Well, one of them is like, well, at least you're mad, otherwise you can't be saying all this stuff. She says loads of stuff about the kings that's really kind of rude. So, if she hadn't have been um, viewed as being mad, she probably would have been killed for all of that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so she's mad, so she can get away with a lot of stuff. Um, obviously, when I say mad, she's not actually mad. But, this is such a happy song. Sorry, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the fact um, Hecabe collapses to the ground um, after Cassandra's proud announcement shows that they haven't been comforted by what she's saying because they think she's mad. Um, so we're going to go on to Andromache. She was the perfect wife. Um, all the Greeks, yep, she was really good. She was a perfect wife then. She aimed at a glorious name. Uh, she suppressed her longing and stayed in the house. And this fits with 5th century Athenian practice. A woman wasn't supposed to go outside or she would get a bad reputation. They had to stay in the house and loom and weave and like never talk, never be heard of. And that was good. <laughs> so Andromache was a really good wife. Um, she also wouldn't tolerate the idle gossip of women. And she kept a quiet tongue in her husband's presence and let no clouds pass over her face. Basically, she was emotionless. She was just like, hey, I'm your wife. I've been looming and weaving. So, that, that was great. Yeah. Um, again, this is what an ideal wife is expected to do. Um, keep quiet and not complain. And Dromiki also claims that she knew when it was right to me to let him, her husband, prevail. And the tragedy is that by being this perfect woman in Greek terms means that her doom was sealed. Um, she's now faced with a choice to betray her beliefs, um, which is, quote, I feel only contempt for the woman who cast her former husband for a new affair, which is what's going to happen to her, because she's going to, her old husband's gone, so she's going to have a new one. Um, but if she tries to stay loyal to Hector and, like, talk out, speak out, she will earn the hatred of her own master. So she's really stuck. She's sort of, yeah, it's, she doesn't know what to do because she can either betray her own belief. Sorry, this is, oh. Okay, I can't turn the camera around, but this guy is walking down the road listening to his music. He's probably like 14 and he's just stopped at the dance. That was brilliant! If you're watching this, you probably won't be because you're 14, but if you're watching this, that was really good dancing. You were wearing a red football t-shirt and had white headphones in. Yeah, that was really good. Um, okay, so, um, <laughs> that was great. Um, yes. She um, also, for society's view, oh no, a woman's lack in power is highlighted by Andromache's lack of choice. 
Also for society's views of women, um, they say a single night thaws a woman's to stay through a man's bed, showing that men think women are broken in like horses and can't resist a man who sleeps with them. So once they sleep with them, they're like, oh, I love you forever. But, great. Um, Hecabee reiterates that there's always hope and recommends Andromache to portray her principles to live. Um, oh, Vic, oh, I like these songs. Um, so I'm sitting on. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, she says, I can't remember what Andromache says something about. I oh, know, Hecabee says, in death there is no hope in life there is hope or some, something to that effect saying that um if you're dead that's it but if you have if you're alive you still have hope anything can happen yeah so um when Tal Thibius tries to take them away take, tries to take away a Steinax he warns Andromache do not pretend to be strong when you're so weak and to avoid doing anything that would bring shame or ill upon you um highlighting that to keep her reputation she has to sacrifice her son um, yeah. And then this is it's quite sad because Hecabe then betrays her own city and people to ingratiate herself with Menelaus and to try and persuade him, referring to her people as barbarian and playing the stereotype of Easterners as morally debauched and living a life of luxury. Tragically, this earns her nothing. Even when she later begs Menelaus in the name of dead Greeks, I entreat you in their name, in their children's name. So it's quite sad that she betray everything that she believed in just to try and persuade him and nothing happened because of it. Um, even the chorus in Trojan Women are figures of pity, whereas highborn women like Hecabe, Andromache and Cassandra are especially chosen. The chorus too will suffer a miserable fate but easily represent but represent easily forgotten ordinary people. Um, they do all look up to Hecabe and they ask her a lot what's going to happen to them but they are just ordinary people and um, we only hear like directly from one of them and stuff so yeah it's quite sad um helen perhaps well not perhaps she shows the negative side of women she's manipulative and evades all responsibility playing on her beauty and female cunning um in the trojan women the trojan women represent tragedy of powerlessness in their society and suffering the name must endure to glorify their masters so Trojan Woman isn't the happiest play when we come to talk about women in tragedy. Um, lastly, Medea. And Medea is seen by some as a feminist play, but others as a misogynist play. So <laughs> it's like two complete opposites. Um, Medea's famous speech contains very early feminist ideals, such as, Surely of all creatures that have life and will, we women are the most wretched. When, for an extravagant sum, we have bought a husband, we must then accept him as the possessor of our body. For women, divorce is not respectable. To repel the man, not possible. They tell us, we at home live free from danger. They go out to battle. Fools. I'd rather stand three times in the front line than bear one child. However, this speech is given to manipulate the chorus into supporting her plan of murder. And kind of that supports the idea that women are devious. <laughs> um, she also says, the noise of war, the look of steel, makes her a coward. But touch her right in marriage and there's no bloodier spirit. And that is, well she's actually there implying that women are weak but sexually jealous and vengeful. She manipulates Creon when he comes in. She's like, don't let me alarm you Creon. I'm in no position, a woman, to wrong a king. And then she admits it. Um, I think, did she make that to the chorus? Yes. Yeah. Um, she's like, do you think I would have fawned on this man, Creon? Except to gain my purpose, carry out my scheme. Um, she sees the weakness in Aegeus, manipulates him for her own purposes, and then uses the male weakness to destroy Jason. She tells the chorus, We were born women, useless for honest purposes, but in all kinds of evil skilled practitioners, which can be taken as misogynist or sarcastic, as the chorus responds by highlighting that men are deceitful and women will be honoured now. Sorry, this video is getting really long, but this is a kind of... It might, is it, I think... My teacher thinks that this will probably come up in our um, exam because women haven't come up a lot, so this is important. Um, don't worry, we're nearly finished. I've only got a few pages of notes left. I'm joking, I've got half a page of notes left. Um, it's quite small writing though. Probably another three minutes. Um, yeah. So, men's views of women it shows when Jason, oh, the lovely Jason, um, says that if women didn't exist, human life would be rid of all miseries. Yeah, nice, Jason. 
great but if women didn't exist you wouldn't be here and I don't think really anyone would be here unless all the way back there they like found out how to grow babies uh, he also says if all's well with your sex life you're everything you wish for but when that goes wrong at once that is best and the noblest turn to gall so he's just saying that all she is is sexually jealous um, Madea is in fact shown to be motivated partly by sexual jealousy but Jason will not admit any heroism on her part um, and we all kind of got to remember that she's based on Ajax and she loads like loads of times she refers to the fact that she won't be laughed at she hates um, being humiliated just like Ajax. Uh, she says, yes, I can endure guilt, however horrible. The laughter of my enemies, I will not endure. She also says, um, I can't remember the direct quote, but um, when she's planning on the murder, she's like, um, but if I die, they will mock me or they will whisper behind my back or something, or I will seem to be weaker, or something like that. So that um, shows that, um, oh, remember you can paraphrase, so you don't have to have that quote exactly. But um, that shows that while she is willing to die, and she's fine about that, she is not willing to be humiliated. She'd take death over being humiliated. Um, so she really has to prove herself. Um, yeah, and at the end, when Jason is shouting up to her, she claims that he is entirely responsible for the death of his sons. She's like, no, not your hands, but your insult to me and your newly wedded wife. Here she picks up both on the heroic code and sexual jealousy. But Jason being Jason only picks up on the latter. Um, but she replies, is that injury a slight one? Do you imagine to a woman? Highlighting what she said earlier, that a woman's marriage is all she has in society. She doesn't have anything else. They don't have anything else. Um, oh, we've got to remember that she also challenges Jason in the Agon to realise that she was the hero in the myth, not him, and she performed all the heroic acts on his behalf. But he dismisses this, showing that the woman's manly and strong characteristics were written off. However, um, oh great, this is going to be stuck in everyone's head for the rest of the day. It's cool, maybe. Um, well, yes, yeah, so, uh, the gods support her. Jason thinks that the gods support him. He's always like, Zeus, look what's happened, and stuff like that. And come down and bring justice. But they don't support him. They support her, which is very surprising, um, considering that in these times, he hasn't done anything wrong. He was allowed to go and marry again. She's the one that's done wrong. She's killed her parents. Um, she's killed her children. She's like, she's, she's killed a lot of people and stuff. So she should be the one being punished, but the audience could be kind of shocked that the gods are supporting her. Um, she has a G6 machina, even though she's not a god, and with the support of the son, her grandfather. Um, she suddenly has divine aspects. All of a sudden, they really like her. <laughs> um, she predicts Jason's future accurately. She's like, you'll die a not noble death. Um, he'll be hit by timber of the ship Argos. And she has the power set up a gold cult. Um, I think this is still around today, or it, or no, it existed in Euro, um, Euripides' day, like a cult of Medea. Um, that shows that a men's assumptions about women's limitations were not necessarily accurate. Um, Medea flouts all female conventions, and while based on a Homeric hero, she achieves what none of them do, namely she wins and she's not punished. And that's a huge challenge to the contemporary assumptions. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, that's Women in Tragedy. Um, I'm sorry, it was a really, really long video. 23 minutes. I think that is my record. But if you sat through and watched this, you've nearly done half an hour of vision. You can go and probably watch the video of Call Me Maybe because it'll be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. Okay. Um, bye. Good luck in your classics tragedy exam. It is this Friday. So, good luck. And, uh, bye.